Lima, bienvenidos a la conferencia sobre cómo... Hello and welcome to this conference. We're going to be talking about how does the brain of chess players work. And to start, we are going with a theatrical enactment. Let's imagine it is 9 p.m. any day in the week, and we are just about to have dinner. We are at the restaurant in a hotel, and there is an international open tournament going on. The city doesn't matter where we are, because chess is universal. It could be London, Johannesburg, Buenos Aires, Pekin, Beijing, or Bilbao. It doesn't matter. Both Adriana and myself, we have been playing very hard. And now, just as thousands of chess players every day, all through the world, we will be talking about the tournaments and about the games. But without the board, we don't need the board. But we enjoy very much talking about chess because it is our mother tongue. Adriana, I have enjoyed your game very much this afternoon. I will tell you why, but first let's go to the critical position. E4, E5, F3, 6, D4, pawn G4. Well, maybe we will have to get rid of the pawn. Pawn F3, D5, and pawn c4, which is threatening mate in f7. And there, the competitor did very well, because he did f6. But do you know at what other game we reach exactly the same position? Well, yes, it is true, knight f6. That would have reminded uh, Murphy's game. Do you remember in the opera? Yes, that's right. A game that everybody talks about. They were in, at the opera in Paris. The, yes, it was the Seville's Barbieri playing. Murphy was there, right there on the stage. And it was the Comte du Soir uh, who was there. And he invited Murphy, who was the best player in the world at that point, and also the Brunswick Duke. The three of them were there. And at that point, the Count and the Duke were playing against Murphy. And at that position, instead of uh, Dame F6, Queen F6, it was, it was Knight F6. And then there was F7 with a Bishop F7. If the Maybe that could have been a checkmate very quickly if they hadn't paid attention. But the count did very well for the defense because they played uh, f7, and if it had eaten the knight, then there would be a checkmate at b4, and everything would have changed to alleviate the pressure. But Murphy didn't uh, want to take uh, that piece, the pawn. That is why he did the knight f3. That was much more flexible. That was more risky, riskier too. And then f6 for the black pieces because the knight was pointing at b5, d5. And then another idea by Murphy's was to take the bishop to g5, putting the knight there in combination with the white knight. That was very dangerous. That is why the competitors did c6. And then if we wanted, we wanted also the queen to be defending the uh, pawn. And then there was another game. Yes, Murphy developed the bishop and then b5 for the black pieces. And I think that that is something that uh, we didn't understand because he was pushing so hard that I had to get rid of this pressure of the bishop and the king. So I'm going to do b5 to have the bishop. But Murphy didn't have any intention whatsoever to move the bishop. No, Murphy, you know, he was always attacking all the time because he was very romantic from the romantic period. And he played there, knight b6. He sacrificed the knight. He goes to c, b5, and checkmate. And the only way to, to defend themselves was knight, the knight which was in b, 
passes or takes to be seven. And then there is a very interesting game, which is attacking and uh, attack and defense, which uh, you know, which was a queen side castling. And we are approaching to one of the most beautiful combinations in history. It is impossible not to smile when we think about it. And then, of course, the black pieces had to be defending that knight, which was threatened, and they have to play with the rook d8. And the king is more and more in the center, the black one, and fireworks start here, because one of the rook is sacrificed at d7, and now rook d7 black and then the other rook comes here to increase the pressure to d1 the counts i guess that they didn't know what to do they said oh this is too much pressure so let's try and free this position so they take the queen to e6 first they offer that exchange of queens i like that the bishop can get, get out yes that bishop was going to stay there all game long and and then the piece of art comes here. The question is, why? What was disturbing to go and try the checkmate? Yes, that is what you would be wondering, right? What would happen if we didn't have, for instance, the knight or if the rook didn't exist? And that is how we teach chess, trying to imagine things, to release imagination. That's right, because that is what can then generate immortal combinations such as this one. Because first we have the bishop, d7, and now knight, d7, and the other knight, d7, and now we're going to sacrifice the queen, queen, b8, checkmate. But yes, I think this is the very best uh, game I have ever seen. Knight, b8, and rook. And at that point, everybody was clapping. Yes, I can imagine the Count and the Duke happy because they had lost, but in such a way, yes, it's a pleasure because maybe they had the intuition that they were making history. That game was going to be immortal and many years later in the 21st century in a Congress talking about education and thinking in Bilbao, they, you know, we would be talking about that game. So let's explain it. Uh, calmly. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and thank you very much for being here. Mainly if we take into account all that is taking place in the other rooms, much more interesting. This little enactment, you know, the aim is to try and explain the difference between logical memory or photographic memory. Adriana and myself, or at least myself and Adriana too, we have not learned that game by heart as if we were just parrots, but we are reproducing it in our mind, think, thinking about logical connections of attack and defense. One piece goes here or there because they are going to be doing something specific or to stop a threat or because they want to attack. Or, so we are not memorizing the games, the game, but we have a cause. The cause of the game makes it possible for us to remember the whole thing. There are certain privileged people, one out of many millions of people, have this photographic memory, an extreme memory that makes it possible for them to read books, for instance, very, very quickly, and then to be able to remember what was being said on, at page 130. 35. That is a gift that very few people have. We, Adriana, we develop logical memory. We connect ideas with each other. Yes, good afternoon. We connect ideas together, pieces uh, together. We put pieces together and we use the association of patterns. For us, there are certain patterns clear that we connect with other patterns. That is how we work. But there is something very interesting, and it is how to teach this to kids with children so that they calculate and imagine all the different positions. And so, you know, in order to be able to remember the final position, what we do is to follow a, a progressive process. First, we ask them to imagine one or two 
moves or games. When we are talking about three and four year olds, it's not that simple. And that is why we never move the pieces to think. The pieces are never moved around. What we are going to be moving are ideas, brain, mind, imagination, but we won't be moving the pieces. That is a mistake that sometimes teachers make when we are coming into the world of education and chess. To show how things happen, here we don't move things, and that makes it possible for us to think. How many of you do you know how to play chess and move the pieces? Well, and uh, maybe some of you know how to move the pawns. And if not, let's uh, do a very quick course to know how to move the pawns on the board. I would like to show you how pawns move. That is very simple. Each pawn at the beginning can go one or two, can make one or two moves. You can go down one or two if you want. This is what I could be doing. You can never go backwards. And another idea to bear in mind when you are going to move the pawns is that they are going to be moving always straight ahead. And when they have to make a capture, they can move like this. This pawn can move like this. Can you see it from there? And now this means that the other pawn, if it wants, I mean, you can also make this capture, this move. Can you see it? Well, don't worry, you didn't need, you don't need to know how to play chess to, to come to this conference. Now we would like to show you the different exercises we can practice with kids and the different skills we are going to be developing as chess players. Maybe we can play with the audience. We are going to be playing only with the pawns. Any volunteer, or if not, any of you can just propose a move. OK, so I think that we're going to be doing is to play a game just with pawns. Let's imagine that the queen is, cannot move. It's not going to be moving so that we don't have to think about the king. So if you move a pawn to the center, you will say four, five, f3, etc. What do we mean? If this pawn moves one step, the game will be h3. And if it takes two, if it moves two, it will be h4. It is as simple as that. But I'm going to be playing with you as a team, but I won't be looking at the chessboard. And once you are just about to win, the game will be over. OK, we need to explain first why have we put the kings there. There is a technical problem in because, you know, we have a very rigorous uh, German game, and they say that, uh, you know, the kings have to be there, but they are not going to be moving. So, but you. Please imagine that we have no kings. We only have pawns. So you're going to be playing with the white pieces. E4. Anybody? You want to play with the black pieces? E5. Adriana? D3. Second move with the white pieces. No, excuse me, with the black pieces. F6. G3. Anybody? Come on, don't be shy. You just need to move a pawn. G5. Adriana, H4. Anybody want to volunteer? G4. Didn't you want to have it? Oh, what a shame. What a pity, Adriana. C3. Sorry, F3. Anybody with the black pieces? C6. D4.
Anybody else? A5. D takes E5. Anybody? F takes F5. ¿Quieres que saquemos el móvil? Should we make a picture, take a picture? Well, no, we maybe could take a picture. No, not a photograph of myself, but the board. Well, if you want, you can take a photograph. You can photograph the chess board, and then we will be able to compare it with something which is just about to take place. Victor, please, now give us an empty board. Victor. Okay, empty, completely empty, no pieces at all, erase. And now please, Adriana, please give us, dictate the final, the last positions that we have there. I'm going to start with the white pawns, white pawns, H4, G3. F2, E4, C3, B2, and A2. And now the black pawns, H7, G4. It is true that, yes, G4, it didn't want to 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 have or to take my pawn well i was kidding e5 this this siete d7 c6 b7 a5 is that all well, this is, this is a spatial visual intelligence. Now, we need to put the kings there. Kings at E1 at, and E8. And now we go, we press OK. And now we need to compare this position with the one we had before. Let's compare it and let's see. And now, I ha should I start praying? Let's compare it. It matches, it's the same, perfect. Mostrar al hacer este tipo de ejercicio es que es absolutamente sencillo. Cualquier persona lo puede lograr, cualquier niño lo puede lograr, sencillamente con una metodología adecuada a través de la GED. Just by using the right method. The interesting thing here is that then through transfer. You can use it in other disciplines. You can generate the, the, the possibility to imagine that reality is moving without uh, having to move it in a specific way so as to generate new circumstances, new situations. So if we go back to logical and photographical memory, and uh, don't be surprised, the record in the world, and we are talking about blind simultaneous games, is 46 simultaneous, simultaneous games. There is a German person who has been able to play 46 games at the same time with his eyes closed, and he knew at any moment where all the pieces were on 46 different boards. That person has that photographical memory, the gift I was talking about before, but Adriana, as she says, any chess player who has a certain level, I mean, not if you have just started, but somebody playing in the Biscaya tournament at any category, you can play blind. You can 
play blindfolded and if you train you can play several games with uh, you know a certain degree of quality because of the difference between these two types of memory for instance if I had done what Adriana had just done maybe the result would have been the same or very similar but if then one of you who has never played chess who doesn't know how to move the pieces if I am given a board with a position with all the pieces there randomly and if I am given one minute or two to try and remember things it's certain and sure that I will be making several mistakes which is the difference between one case and the other in the other case there was no logic the pieces have been scattered randomly but there are no logical connections but here or if I am given uh, a game in, from determined in Mongolia from 1957 something impossible something that I don't know about but it was a real game between two logical players and if I am given one minute to memorize it it's almost certain that I will be able to memorize the whole thing because I have no photographical memory but I have a logical memory something else which attracts people's attention Adriana people who are not experts it is that now we are not going to be playing blind blindfolded and it is to know or to say how a big master how a master can play against 25 30 or 35 players simultaneously very quickly and then he is even able to remember part of those games yes that is very curious it is true you start playing in the different boards but what counts the most important thing is that when you go to the next board it is important to to close this chapter you are now only going to be concentrating on this board here and the same thing one after the other the most important thing is to be concentrating there and not to think about the game before about the board before because if not you will be losing your concentration in those simultaneous games intuition plays a key role you have very little time to think and that is why as long as you move of course and you have to be moving quickly what you have to do when you play is to use your intuition and the global concepts of chess don't concentrate at each um, game but you have to count on your intuition whenever there is something difficult you need to analyze things very quickly well and use your skills as a chess player okay so let's continue playing this is a workshop that's why we need your participation and now it is true that when I asked how many of you knew how to move the pieces now I know that we have more than you know volunteers because now we need five players so as to play against Adriana let me say something first let me clarify something nobody will be cruelly defeated by Adriana no not at all and the other way around no no neither the thing is just to come up here just to start playing a game uh, to start playing and then we will be using that so that later on Adriana can explain how does the brain of a chess player works so you are not going to be defeated at the end of the game no well we have no time to do that so please five volunteers come up on the stage to try and help us with this activity but you have to swear that you won't defeat me you won't be defeating me well sometimes we have surprises in situations such as this one okay we have two volunteers thank you for being here we have a third volunteer a third player Chema and Victor if we have no more volunteers Chema and Victor you are volunteers number four and five so Adriana Adriana has already played with the white pieces please each of you take a board and now let me tell you something before and then of course Adriana will be telling us about how their brain works but before let me share some ideas with you or some anecdotes with you 
is everything clear? We are going to move the board. It's not possible, apparently. There is Bobby Fischer. Let me tell you an anecdote about him. Bobby Fischer, for some people, is the best player ever in history. And once he was playing simultaneously against 30 or 40 players, and one of the competitors, who was not very good at chess, said to a friend of him, he said, but it's impossible for this guy to remember where the pieces are in 40 different boards. That is completely impossible. And then at that point, this man, he grabbed a pawn, a pawn, or a bishop, and then at that point he had one more piece. Fisher arrived in here, Fisher arrived, he did his game, and he continued. So this person was very happy and he said to this man, you see, I cheated, him. I fooled Fisher. It was impossible for him to have that memory. Four or five movements later, they reached a position where Fisher could have the bishop. So that is what he did. But what he did was to take the piece, he put it into his pocket and he went away. Okay, to, you know, in exhibitions such as this one, but with many more boards, of course, you need to be very, very concentrated. And sometimes it's not as easy as that because we all have a private life, emotions, problems. So that's why before we start playing in an exhibition such as this one, it is very important to clean our minds so as to be able to concentrate. And now I'm thinking about an anecdote, something that happened to one of the best players in the 1920s, Bronstein. Bronstein this player one day he arrived in the tournament it was not something simultaneous but with just one opponent he sat down and he it took him 40 minutes to make the first move and then he succeeded so at the end of the game the opponent said master please I have a question for you could you please tell me why the hell did it take you 40 minutes to decide how to start playing and he said well no 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 the only problem is that I couldn't remember where I had left my keys and the, the keys from my apartment and you know I couldn't concentrate I was thinking about my keys after an exhibition such as this one it is quite normal for the master the professor to go to his place to go home and maybe he will be able to remember maybe he won't be remembering all the games because maybe if your opponent is not a very good player it will be much more difficult to remember that game because it won't be a very logical one but if the opponent was a reasonably good player if the game was logical, then it would be much, much easier. Adriana, I'm sure that, you know, if she had been playing against 25 good players, she would be able to remember most of it. Because for us, for chess players, chess is like our mother tongue. We are all the time linking, connecting those games with a logical approach. I did this and then he did that. That is the whole idea. So, Adriana, how are you doing? What can you tell us? There are certain games. He's very concentrated. There are certain games which are quite similar. There are similarities. Do you remember the first game that we showed with Leonto by Murphy? There are two games which are similar, this one and then the third board and the, the fourth board. You know, they have certain similarities and that make it possible for us to play quicker. There, I have one more piece. It makes me a bit happier. And now, 
we are, you know, in the middle of the game. We need to start having a strategy and some tactics tactics because uh, you know the first part was a bit more mechanical but now we need a strategy so now adriana i'm going to ask you to do something please think out aloud think aloud so that we can follow your line of thought but before i would like to say thank you to our volunteers thank you very much <laughs> Okay, Adriana, now you have to play in the five positions and please try to think aloud and to tell us what do you think or how is the way you think in every and each of the five. Uh, to think is very difficult and aloud is even more difficult. In this position, the problem I have got that I must uh, go into the castle, into the castle position quite quickly. And the advantages are that I can really take, uh, first of all, the knights, uh, then the bishop, and then the pawn, and then I'll be able to take it, to take the pawn at the end. So then in this position, I have taken this bishop. There is one more bishop. I had to sustain the position to move the pawn at the center to attack the queen to take off the knight and then the topic is more solved somehow because these figures are easier the pieces are easier in this position after having taken the black ones that have been placed here the advantage is bigger because this structure of pawns is more difficult in order to be for them to to stand the black ones and i haven't got any exit there so i have to pay attention to the fact that we have to get castle there with an open column that it could be very dangerous but as i have got the advantage i could take off these pieces and to get into the castle on the other side is more balanced somehow and in this position this position is a typical one this is something that is called the italian opening and we do not have really to think because it corresponds to and study so let's say that we know uh, these moves so this is an italian opening and when i have taken the night this is just a variation that i know and i know it by heart uh, so more or less i need 12 10 moves farther so you really don't need to think simply we have to be alert if he gets wrong then we have to make up something new and here this is a position typical of the italian opening too so it is too long with the things we do know by now it's much simpler so in all these uh, games where the position has got one more piece, the only thing I have to do is to sustain the position, not to make the mistake of giving a piece as a gift and to play according to intuition, because it's enough then to develop the pieces in a current way, to develop the movement. Okay, and now what is still missing, what we still lack to complete is to explain which are the scientific uh, fundamentals of all these things. And we are at that point, and we really are very lucky right now because the most modern technology is applied to this study of the brain, so the uh, magnetic uh, scanner or resonance. And uh, the, magne the magnetoencephalogram allows us uh, to study the human brain much better than we used to do. We know much more right now thanks to those techniques. We know much more about the brain, and many scientists of many countries in the world are choosing the brains of the chess players as, uh, as a kind of experiment animals in order to make these studies because they think they can be special. We are going to offer you the PowerPoint we have prepared. And uh, they are like linear peaks, and we have to explain why a chess player can do all these things. So to play a game with a level of concentration that is very, very high for six hours. And then we are going to see a video where quite the opposite happens. They play at the rhythm of two moves per second, and the whole game lasts less than five minutes. So to play blindfolded test as what we have been doing, Adriana and myself in the restaurant before at that corner, or to play sims, uh, sim, uh, games uh, as we have seen. So let's go and have a look at the PowerPoint. So all these skills are typical of a chess player and they have got to do too with the fact that there are some parts of their brain that are working in a specific way, in a different way to the ones of other people. So, Victor, we can go on them. So this is what is really useful for me as a kind of a script in order to explain this. 
patterns and so on as Adriana has said before we thanks to the trick of these patterns let's say that way we have succeeded in saving energy and memory I'm going to give you an example if I am said if I am told defense in Domenoni this is the way of the multiple ways of the black figure species to start uh, the game and me automatically although I'm not watching any chessboard in my head I have got these pieces represented because this in Domenoni defense the castle is made in this way so the the king uh, is castled in this corner with uh, the rook by his side, uh, the bishop in front of the king, and then the pawn. So we have got seven pieces for you. Apart from, if you are not chess players, each of these pieces is a unit of memory. But for me, the seven are just one unit of memory. So therefore, I am saving a lot of memory and energy. For me, this is a pattern. This is a pattern of just one unit. I remember the seven at the same time. And this is what the group said. He was a Dutch researcher who made a wonderful research about this. Much more recent is Fernand, uh, Fernando Gove, uh, whom I dedicate a very big deal of my book. Uh, I recorded three hours of conversation with him. He is talking really about layouts or patterns. Uh, what is it really? I have got an approximate idea of where, of where the black pieces are if the blacks have been made in this indomenon in defense. If I do uh, organize them in the way in the way we've done it, I would be very close to the black figures then, to the black pieces. It doesn't matter uh, where the white ones are, that's an story. But this could be a kind of template or layout. There can be differences. Perhaps this rook at a certain time has not reached this point. It's still here, but I know it's going to come here because it's hard to support the move of this pawn. So for me, I insist again, all these things really only uh, have the space of two three units of memory for somebody who is not a chess player to remember all these things is a unit of memory for each pawn or each piece the one that this person has to remember and those are really the templates and patterns and this is what allows us to remember many many things Amitsik discovered that the, the fans used uh, above all when they are playing the part of the brain which is stirring the most recent memories so as if each position could be new. Whereas the big teachers, the big experts, turn to the part of the brain of the most consolidated memories. This can be something subconscious. I can be analyzing a position, and I, can, I might not remember in a conscious way that 30 years ago I played a very similar a game, or I saw one in a book very similar to the position I have got now. It is not something that I remember in a conscientious way, but it is there in my hardware. So I'm turning to that part of the brain but a beginner for instance would see this position and would be using the part of the fresh of the most recent immediate memories of the brain this is in order to make it even more difficult this is a very big challenge the next is the next one is yeah the flaws, the, the, the defects, the mistakes, that's a very interesting research that we could explain in this way. The vast majority of human beings use a certain amount of uh, brain energy in order to control the basic issues and functions of the body, so to breathe, uh, to keep the balance, to see. So this occupies a next part of brain energy. The general or the frequent practice of chess allows the chess players to reduce the consumption of energy of that part of the brain to the minimum, to the minimum essential, in, to the bare essentials for these functions to take place. So to breathe, to keep the balance, to be sitting and so on. So the key of this is that it releases energy in order to be able to concentrate the maximum energy in the analysis of the position we are looking at. 
So this is perhaps another difference that has been discovered thanks to these scientific researches. And the one of Tanaka is a very recent one, has been published very recently in many other places. This, he has uh, experimented with uh, brains of Chinese chess also. Yes, it is called, and it is different to the international one. But to the effect of the things we are saying, it is really valid. He has discovered that there's a part of the brain that is the angulate cortex. So if I put a finger here on my forehead and then I would push it to behind, then it would occupy all these things. So whether, if you are thinking of attacking or defending, one part of the cingulate cortex gets active when he is thinking of attacking, the rear one is activated and the four the four run the four one if he wants to defend. This can be really applied to many things. We cannot, it is very useful, for instance, in the marketing, when the people are designing the packaging of a product in order for them to make it more attractive uh, for the buyers, or how to place the products in a supermarket so that we are tempted to buy them, or in the TV publicity, how to launch a subliminal message. I think it's forbidden right now. But technically, it's something totally feasible that uh, is stimulating us to buy a product. So we are talking about something that although is discovered, taking into account, first of all, the brains of the chess players, it can be applied everywhere. And very soon, we are going to know much more about the human brain and the things we knew 50 years ago. And the chess players' brains are being useful in order to make this research. I wanted to make a reminder to highlight something, Leon Cho, and it's that the emotional part has also an impact in the chess player. When we are playing a game, this emotional part is something essential. I have, say, I have seen and I have experienced myself what it means to be afraid, what it means to be obviously under the trying pressure with the anxiety of obtaining a certain result in a game and to see that how brain gets blocked. I think that all of you have felt the same in other disciplines. So the interesting thing is to realize or to rather to learn when these emotions come in order to uh, to build a kind of protection garment for the for the brain to keep on working. Another thing I wanted to highlight, Leon Cho, is that as play, as chess is played on a plate is usually in a, in a very slow way, but sometimes in very, very quick uh, quick uh, games. And in my case, I am a disaster in uh, the quick uh, games. I, I am not one of the ones who are very good at that, and I made many, many other mistakes. So to think of unnecessary things, and perhaps nobody in the public has experienced that, so to think of the unnecessary things, is a habit that it's quite evolved, quite wicked for the chess or for any other discipline because you think so often the same thing that at the end you cannot make a decision, this is another thing. And what I wanted also to remark, and it was very interesting, is that when you are learning as a chess player to think in an ordered way, it's very difficult to put place in order, but in chess it's even more. And I think that one of the big advantages brought by the chess is that uh, it, te it teaches you to teach in a very ordered way, so one after the other, one game after the other, but also move after another move. A trainer I used to have told me, when you have a noise in your heart, do not come to play a tournament because he loses every game. I think you have, you must have a balance in your emotional uh, personality so that the brain can work well. About the way Adriana is applying all these things in this school, in this primary school, kindergarten of talents in Bogota. So for the people who have not been in my in my conference this morning, 100% of her four-year-old uh, students uh, know how to play chess, play violin, and they also practice Taekwondo. And Adriana will also explain this in her conference. So we are going to expand the idea of how for chess players, chess is a kind of mother tongue. And we are going to see that thanks to some images, which are really breaking into pieces the typical image of the chess player. So to people who do not move at all for hours, we can see how you can play chess with two moves per second. Cancer, the champion of the world has got 30 seconds in his watch and he is going to make 60 moves approximately in those 30 seconds.
Då startar vi igen med EF och Bonna. Spela Oj, eh men kommer kommer igång det. Och sen blir motat, är det motat, det blir motat. Hur det är att Okay, technically what it has happened, technically what it has happened is that as the arrival of Kalser had only the king and Kalser has run out of time, the game is a kind of tie or draw and people cannot only win with just one uh, king, so you cannot uh, make this checkmate, so according to the ruling. Well, the important thing is that Kalser has made 60 moves. Some of them have not been seen because uh, the person who has shot the film has cut off a little bit of of this game, but I can calculate that it's only 60 moves. Can this be done just by the champion of the world? No, children can do that too. Everybody can, even us, even ourselves. Not with the same quality, but at the same speed, and even funnier. The most important thing is to enjoy oneself playing chess, and from that moment onwards, creativity goes to surface. Fun and creativity are always hand in hand. This has been so funny, and really, I feel so much energy now, but I can't resist myself because you have just said that you that you play the quick one so badly. I'm going to defeat you, to beat you. I'm going to beat you to death right now, and this could be the end, a uh, fantastic end for our presence here. <laughs>